Oh, oh my God. Should we, should we tell them what happened? Do they really <laughs> want to know? <laughs> so a couple things. Uh, first and foremost, we don't have a name for the podcast yet. If you have a name that you want to recommend, shoot us a DM, Instagram, YouTube, wherever you find us. Let us know what you think that we should call the podcast. Today, we've got my, my good friend, Karnveer, on the show here. <laughs> on this uh, nameless podcast. Nameless. Nameless. <laughs> All right, so we're here on the nameless podcast. The yeah. nameless, but it's faceless, recording. but faceful. Oh, oh my God! Should we should we tell them what happened? Do they really <laughs> want to know? <laughs> uh, I'm a little bit embarrassed to tell them, but I think we should, man. I think we should. This well, is our our second podcast of the day for the day. Yeah, one morning <laughs> and one afternoon. At this point, we could probably just start recording two podcasts a day. We're such professionals. I mean, yeah, we might as well. <laughs> So you guys won't believe it. On the first run through, we, um, uh, I, I connected all the mics, but I forgot to plug it into the camera, so we didn't have any audio. The funny <laughs> thing is, we were so focused on the backlight, yeah, not putting so many shadows on our face. That was the main. Con that was my kind of logic and thinking of forget about everything else. Let's just try to dim this out as much as possible, so then we get mm. a clear, crisp picture. Right. The opposite happened. Yeah. Last week, clean, clean, clean sound. No video. Faces can't be seen. Today, the faces can be seen, but the voices are barely heard. Yeah, it's the exact opposite. Oh, man. Totally and then we had, uh, we had another mess yeah. up. The camera overheated. Because <laughs> yeah. I had to mess with one of the, the frame rate. So frame nice. rate, setting. Yeah. <laughs> All of it. So we're finally here. Uh, should we do... I think we should do a bit of an intro. What do you, th what do you say? Yeah, sure. Intro. So, so a couple things. Um, First and foremost, we don't have a name for the podcast yet. So if you have a name that you want to recommend, uh, shoot us a DM, Instagram, YouTube, wherever you find us. Let us know what you think that we should call the podcast. I've had this idea that I've been sitting on. I, I might share with you guys at some point. Um, but uh, today we've got my, my good friend, Karnveer, on the show here <laughs> on this uh, nameless podcast. Nameless. Nameless. <laughs> Um, and, and like I mentioned, this is our, our second podcast of the day. So yeah. Um, third podcast in total. Yeah. This is podcast three. number three. It is. Usually people start quitting after the third or fourth try. And we've actually just overcome that hurdle <laughs> just by doing the second one in one day. Should we, should we record like 10 together? So that together. Over, yeah. And then we just call content. Right. We've, yeah. By then it'll be just mumbling and jumbling. Cause we'll just run out of everything. To we, talk we would have talked about what do people even talk about at that point? You know what I realize? Uh, podcast is like uh, podcasting is like dating. Like you're yeah. getting to know someone. You kind of know them professionally because of what what they do for work. But you're really it's like it's like speed dating in an hour. Yeah. It's also daily thoughts. Mm -hmm. Daily thoughts. Any right. obstacles that you face during the day. Right. Like that's what you're talking about with your spouse or your partner at the end of the day. Yeah. It's hey honey, like how was your day? Right. And then they get into it. Oh, you know. Do you think do you think couples should podcast at the end of the day? There's already a lot of couples podcasting really? right now, and there are. There's the one I've heard of is the Red Red Talk, Red Table Talk with Will Smith and Jada Pinkett. Oh man, I don't know about that one. That's a little bit too unfiltered for me. Yeah, there should be some reservation to protecting privacy. What's What's happening behind closed doors? Yeah, some of the stuff. Some of the stuff that they they say is just um, it's completely wrong. Yeah, I don't think they should share to the point where. They're trying to be so honest and so raw. Right. But you're not really, what you're doing is you're not really just, just you're justifying your own honesty. Right. But you're hurting other people's feelings by bringing the, your guys' mutual situation into it. Right. And how comfortable is the other person to share? Mm -hmm. Probably not as comfortable. It's why that thing is just going haywire. Right. But I think they've talked about, I'd, I'd guess I'm not them. Yeah. But. My guess is they sit down and talk about it. Do we want to do this? Do we want to share this stuff? Yeah. What, yeah. what I think is it, does it, because even just us being on this podcast and recording this, I know like, you know, I get, you get, once you get comfortable, like yeah. you almost don't feel like the camera's there and it feels like I'm just talking to you. Yeah. But uh, there are moments where I'm like, oh wait, there is a camera watching me. And yeah. so am I being a little bit more polished? Or am I being a little bit more polite? So I have those moments, but. Uh, I wonder if like over time when you get really good at this that you almost don't even know that the camera's there and that you're yeah, recording like it. 24 hour recording. 
All right. They talk about it in uh, a lot of those shows that are reality TV. Just becomes you. Where after a couple of days, they say, we don't even realize that there's cameras following us around. Yeah. They're just going about our day-to-day -day life. The only thing is when we're trying to go from one space to another space, right? we have to slow our pace down for the cameraman to catch up. Right. Because it might be something that's pivotal that's happening in that moment. Right. And this is where the scriptedness comes in. Because if there's a really good shot and somebody starts crying, right. they're like, okay, you know what? We need you to run that back and, do it, and do it again and they'll feed you lines right so jersey shore i loved watching jersey shore at the beginning right and once i once you started pulling back the curtain like work wizard of a Haas, it's right. just a person just controlling these characters right these they're like puppets th yeah they're controlling these people right like characters and now these characters have become these people right but off screen they're completely different people they're completely you really different. think so i i think so uh to a to a certain extent do you think, do you think people would be nicer or better people if they know they're being recorded all the time. Like Jersey Shore is the one exception because well, they're taught to like be belligerent and do all the things that they're doing. That again, viewers so. That's true, but that's what. But that that works in that environment. But if I'm like, if I'm a normal person, I'm, I'm not normal by any means, but I'm normal. Yeah. But if I'm if people are if someone's recording me and I know that all the time, am I not forced to be the best version of myself all the time? Yeah, you would be. So wouldn't that just inherently make me a better person? I don't know. That's the yeah, it would be. Of, yeah, of course, you would want to try more. You would want to show your best, best qualities, best you'd also, forward. Yeah, of course. And then also, dress well, first impression, all the time. Wake up on time, work out. Dude, yeah, because now there's an expectation put on you. Right. It'd be like the Truman Show, but right. in the Truman Show, Jim Carrey didn't know what was happening to him until the very end, and then he just exits out, and he's like, right. Thank you. Good night. Good day. Whatever he kind of exits off of. Right. But in the beginning, he's living his life as is. Right. But the characters within that movie are rehearsed. Right. And they're trying to be this thing, person. this character, yeah. this person around him. And they couldn't act normal because they had to push this character to kind of progress in a certain way. Yeah. For the viewers. Right. It'd be kind of cool, man. Yeah. Just being on camera all the time. Oh, and man. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I like, like the, the Kardashians, like just being on camera and they probably have a lot of stuff written out in their contract as well. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. To keep some stuff out. Oh, yeah. When you're worth a billion dollars, the way they or, are. Or it gets edited to like crop that stuff out. Yeah. Especially if it's like, like controversial topics, like, yeah. you know, uh, g gender and like certain things that are really strike a chord with people. They're probably taught to like, hey, a big portion of your fan base is yeah. this way. So you can't talk about this. Yeah, because uh, it might rub people the wrong way. So aside from that, you cuffed your pants, dude. I yeah. So uh, what's the uh, what's the new thing? Y yeah. So I've been told that hipsters cup cup <laughs> their pants, and uh, I looked over. I watched that you had your your pants cuffed. So I'm like, why don't I do it? Yeah, I, it's funny because I was. Uh, I think we talked about this this morning when we tried the first go. <laughs> is uh, I I approached you and said, do you want to be my stylist? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, you dress really well. Yeah, better than I can ever dress. Yeah. I tend to wear baggy clothes and my shirts don't fit and I don't care as much about fashion, but I'd like to. I think first impressions are important. It's knowing what you know and not knowing what you don't know. Yeah, and I don't know fashion, so I yeah. have a friend like Karin Weir that <laughs> accessorizes. And, uh, you know what's so, funny? I've helped a lot of friends. Yeah? When it's time for their well, weddings, receptions, dude, uh, engagement. You don't got to wait for my wedding. Start yeah. now. I'm yeah. putting in my wardrobe. Tell me what I got to throw out. Get a budget going and it's simple. Dude. Get some monochromatic i tones the and thing is people would pay for a stylist i get one for free you know what here's <laughs> another thing here's another thought i had i i spent a lot of money on clothing and like i feel based on everybody's reaction i'm mm -hmm. always one of the better dressed people right that's not for sure me tweeting my own no no I, people it, tell it, me they're like obvious you always got the nice clothes on you always got yeah nice drip whatever they want to say right however my thought process has become more about how about creating a uniform right Having that one basic tee, whether it's white or black. Right. Having that dark denim. Right. Whether it's like a nice, nice wash, got a fade on it, or if right. it's just like dark blue or black. Right. One jacket. Very simple. Everywhere you go, every single day, you don't got to think about it. Right. Because my process to get ready, I got to think Quick. about, I got, no, my, my is horribly wrong. It's like right. horribly long. Long. And that's very, very wrong way to do it. Right. Like the days, the nights before that I prepare right. for the interview or the meeting, right? It's fine because I go through all my stuff, throw it on the bed. Okay, I know what I need to wear. Right. Some nights I get lazy. Like this morning, I got lazy, and this morning I started panicking. I'm like, 
I have about an hour, an hour to put on my pants and put on a shirt. I'm like, what do I wear? Right. It took me 15 minutes just to figure out what right. socks to wear with which shoes and if right. this is going to match my belt. I mean, just the fact that it's intentional is impressive, but it is uh, quite different than like, like very successful entrepreneurs like Steve Jobs, same black, tur if you watch his videos, same black turtleneck sweater. These guys don't uh, care. No, they don't. If you look at uh, Mark Zuckerberg, same thing, t-shirt, yeah. blank, no, nothing on it. But no, I, I think I don't know what kind of phobias they had. Yeah, but yeah, they, yeah. Phobia or whatever it was, but I don't know. Yeah, they're just trying to conserve their energy from their mind. That's, that's what it is. But I, I think you can have it all. Like, uh, yeah. Uh, I think, uh, I, I don't want to butcher his name, but uh, he owns the LVMH uh, company, the brand. Oh, Louis Vuitton. So, yeah, uh, he owns the whole yeah. Christian Dior, Louis Vuitton, all those. But apparently that man, Ber I think it's Bernal Bernard. Bernard Renault? Yeah, yeah. yeah and that's he's it. a trillion dollar guy. Yeah, and he dresses well everywhere he goes and yeah. it's fashionable. He understands brand. So yeah. I think, I don't think it's a requirement. Like people think like, oh, I have to wear the same uniform and make less decisions. I think that's the thing I've heard. Yeah. Is like six successful entrepreneurs, what they say is it's one less decision. I can preserve my decision-making capacity. I think it's a little bit of a story they yeah, tell themselves. It is. Also, you know what it is? Fashion is expensive. Right. Style is accessible. Right. I can probably wear the cheapest clothes. Right. Well, probably, probably the best rest. That's true though. No, because, because like with, with your, I don't know if you're wearing brand name, but it looks like it. It looks like when I meet you, I'm like, man, this guy's dressed like a million bucks. Well, but those I don't know, like, it's not like I look at your tags, like what is he wearing? Yeah. But I could just tell that you put thought and effort into color coordination, what's yeah. pleasing to the eye. In fact, uh, because I wanted to get better at dressing better or, or well, I would Google like articles, like what color is match? And I have, I can show it to you on my phone yeah. where it says, if you wear this color jean, you got to wear this color top. Yes. Uh, so if you have like a green top, you should wear a light color jean and this kind of shoe. Yeah. And it puts outfits together, which for me, I need to see it to, to have it, uh, have it work. But, uh, part, especially when I was younger, I had a hard time actually dressing well because I would fluctuate my weight so radically. Like oh, wow. I went from 140 yeah. to 200. That's wild. A lot of my clothes wouldn't fit. Yeah. Like any clothes. Uh, then I would go from 200 to 140. Like I oh. did some rapid. What race. was that about? What happened? That you were just. I just wanted to see if it was possible. Like I was positioning weight size. Like weight. I went from 140 to 200 thinking I just want to get big. Like, you know, high school, you're like, I just want to get jacked. Yeah. Yeah. I just keep going. And I was like, how big can I get? And so I was eating everything. Dirty bulk, McDonald's, like everything. Yeah. So I got to 200 and then my knees started to hurt. Yeah. That happened. And so I had knee pain, uh, my right knee, especially like tendonitis. Mm -hmm. And I tried everything. I would wear these like straps on my knee to try to like not put as much pressure. Like I couldn't figure out why I was having knee pain. Yeah. And then I lost 30, 40 pounds and all my knee pain went away. Of course. And so I didn't realize it was because I was carrying all this weight all the time. It's a direct reflection, man. That's what it was. Yeah. It's just going to push on all your joints. But again, I was just trying to get big. So I thought like, oh yeah, they just say eat as much, right? Because that's the common thing. It's like, just eat everything. Eat everything. If you're skinny, just eat everything. And it, I don't know if no. it works out. And now we, know, now we know it's better. <laughs> yeah. No better is scaling up. Right. And then scale down and scale up and scale right. down. Right. So I went really extreme back, back when. So I probably wouldn't do that again, but it was an experience for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who knows what it did to my hormones, right? <laughs> as long as you can, as long as you're, I guess, removing enough fat from your body and putting on enough muscle, it should be fine. And it looks yeah. like you've actually figured out that you were unhealthy at a certain point. Right. And you started scaling it back. <clears throat> yeah. It's, it's when you get to that point and you break that limit. Right. And then you're not able to bring yourself back and then you go into this right. victim mentality of, oh my God, what have I done? Right. And I can never get to where I was before. Right. Which I is think, not true. Right. Which, which is, I think that was the weird part because it was intentional. Like I was gaining weight intentionally. Yeah. So then I also knew if I can gain weight intentionally, I can also lose weight intentionally. Yeah. Uh, it I, does get harder as you age though. I remember my uncles and aunts would say like, oh, wait till you're my age. You're going to be chubby and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I did actually naturally get chubby because I was getting stuck in the work life. And yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but then, yeah, same thing. I just woke up and said, oh, wait, why, what, what am I doing? What everyone else does? I gotta, uh, I think part of it's brainwash, right? If everyone tells you, no, as you get older, your metabolism slows and this happens, then you justify it and you get older and you're like, my metabolism is slowing. There's this dude, I, and actually it's really interesting, Brian Johnson. Okay. Uh, you'll find him on YouTube or any Google, whatever search. Sure. Dude, this guy is finding a way to 
reverse aging. Yeah, isn't he something like 55 or 45 or something yeah, years he, old? Yeah, and he has a skin of like a 20 year old. Yeah. Because of every, all the food he eats, uh, he does all these like. He's in cryogenics and, and everything. He's in a hyperbolic chamber like Dragon Ball Z, Goku. Everything. He's just reverse aging he himself. Yeah. They, he did this test where uh, I don't know the whole thing, but I just know a little bit of details. But they have these like, uh, like two pins. Mm -hmm. And they bring the pins closer, and they push it on his on his heel and different parts of his heel. Mm -hmm. And then he has to say how many points he can feel. Mm -hmm. But they never actually touch. But he has a qualitative like, oh, it's two, two, two. But it gets to a certain point, and then you can only feel one, even though it's two. Yeah, because the entire thing gets pushed. Right. Instead of feeling the two points. Exactly. And then yeah. that they can determine your age. So, anyways, he did that test, and yeah. they said he has a sensory reception of a seventeen-year-old. Yeah. I was like, what? This is mind blowing. Dude, it's so crazy. That's, yeah. Elasticity of the skin and the feeling and the sensor points. Who knows? All man. of it combined to or just like, whatever it is. Yeah. And I don't know. It, it is such an interesting, uh, and science is such an interesting thing, all in all. Yeah. I agree. Like, I, I, I think as I've gotten older, I've probably started to question science a little bit more. Question it? Of course. You yeah. Like, question it. Just like not take it as absolute fact, right? Like, um, mm -hmm. You know, there's oh, yeah. certain I, things like I just find like whenever it's mass, whenever it's people related on a scale, mm -hmm. it's always so like finite. But like science is rarely like that, right? Yeah. There's a strong correlation that this happens, but it's not like, hey, this is happening every time. There's a lot to do with science. It could be science. It can be medicine. It right. can be physics. It could be chemistry. It could be biology. Right. So everything to a s certain degree. Right. I'm going to just blindly follow what the doctor is because they spent so many years in the medical right. side of industry. Right. But on the other side, when it has to do with some sort of sickness or uh, health related issues, right. I also think that you can put mind over matter. Right. And because one of the most common things that people talk about in the lower mainland is how we get so cold, how it's so rainy. Right. And, you know, this is going straight into our bones. Right. So what I did to kind of counteract that was start watching Wim Hof videos. Mm. Found Wim Hof online. Mm -hmm. He's bathing in ice water. Yeah, he's doesn't doing get sick. breathing exercises, wearing flip-flops, and he's scaling these mountains that are... Dude, it's insane. ...down to zero degrees, which it's, is freezing temperatures where you can they, lose extremities. They did this test with him. They took him and 10 people. And I know what they watched them. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's and gonna, they were all the naysayers. They were, yeah. They were all the scientists that were right. saying, it's impossible to do what you're doing in right. such a short amount of time. Right. And so they would incubate the sickness in them. Yep. And then uh, they, he pretty much showed them by using breath work and cool techniques that yep. they could fight off the sickness before it manifests. Yeah. Uh, which, yeah, it's, it's just so interesting. It's so interesting. So but I think I would say mo most cases, not most, I would say a lot of cases, mind over matter, for sure. It's yep. like, if you believe you're going to get sick, you're just ultimately that you're much. You're going to get sick. Yeah, like you're just, you kind of capitulated, well, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 of course. But uh, yeah, I know it becomes kind of an. I guess it comes down to limiting beliefs then. Yeah, it does. How sure. do you eliminate limiting beliefs? Yeah. And then push your body to a certain degree that you didn't, that people thought was not possible. Right. It's why we, I love watching the Olympics. Right. Because there's these superhumans, which are 0.001% of the world. Right. And they're breaking these feats that nobody has before. Right. And they're breaking it from the person before them from 10 years ago, 15, 20. Right. And the obstacle always is when the commentator's like, this record has never been broken. And world record. World record, uh, Olympic record. And now somebody comes in and when they say, when I say shatter it. Right. And then I give you the metrics of it. 0 0.01 second, the world record has been shattered. Right. Like 0 0.01 second. You can't even blink fast blink. enough. Yeah. And these people, are, and that's what they're calling shattering right. records. Right. What did that person have to do to get to a state of being sub my 10 time. seconds? Right. Sub 0. 0.1 so I, second. So I question, so like a lot of me does talk, like I think about limiting beliefs all the time. Mm. But like Usain Bolt was the perfect example because one of the races he won, do you remember? I don't know if you remember this, but he won the race and he actually looked back. Yeah, he did that. And he like looked at the people that were running behind him. Yeah. And he put his arms out, which... There's drag, you slow down. Yeah. He's looking back, not paying attention. And he still, and he still beat the record. He still beat the record. So that makes me question, what if he actually tried? Actually he tried. was the one guy I was like, he's taunting these guys, looking over his shoulder, yeah. putting his arms out. You know, he's doing his little poses, yeah. all that. But I'm like, what if he was actually trying? <laughs> How much faster could he get? 
There's oh, a yeah. there's this guy named Roger Bannister. I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, he ran something called the first four minute mile. Yes, he so did. So they had this, you know, again Olympics where they would run four minute miles, and or they would run a mile, and they would say that it's impossible to run a mile under, under four, minutes. four minutes. Yeah. So it's impossible to do that until he did it, and then after he did it. Hundreds of people that everybody did it. Everyone started breaking that record. It was week after. They used week to after say week. that's not possible. So it, it's a limiting belief. And now sub four is the now norm. now now yeah now we're like now you have yeah. to hit that pace. Now we I mean we can't run a four minute mile. I can't. I don't know. Maybe I can't. Maybe you've got some athleticism, but no, I can't do that. But but yeah, when we watch people that do it full time, treat it professionally, like if they don't get sub four minutes, they're not even in the conversation. So how do you get into the record books? Yeah. You got to be under four minutes minimum. Yeah. Otherwise, then nobody's going to be talking about you. Right. And then you got to do it consistently for twenty more miles. Right. To start breaking records. Yeah. <laughs> the other the other cool thing is like uh, now it's like almost to be exemplary. Like, yes, you have to beat a record, but you have to do it over and over. Like the game is ch- totally different. Like, yeah, winning a championship is such a big deal, but in NBA it isn't. In NBA, yeah. you're, not, you're not even in the conversation unless you win five. It's lackluster now. It's because the comparisons have already been made. Right. Right. They've, they've it's like LeBron's like LeBron's a great player, but it's like overall great player. A phenomenal. What he's done in 2025. And years. just in his style, he's not copying anyone. He's not emulating. He's doing his own way. Yeah. He's got five championships, but now he gets compared to Michael and it's like, not even close. And I'm like, he played a totally different game. Yeah. Played a totally different game. He played his game, which I think is more impressive. Yeah. And like, I think like Drake didn't come into music and start doing like hardcore rap. Nope. He came into like soft, loving rap and like girls and this and that. Yeah. But he won and he did it in his own way. And I think that's impressive. As long as you put your own tune to it, you yeah. march on the own beat of your drum. Right. It's what people are going to resonate to. And that's where authenticity comes in. 100%. Right? Yeah. If it's authentic cue yeah. and people can catch on to it, right. that's what it's going to be. If you're going to try to be somebody else, Right. 50 Cent talks about Ja Rule all the time about how he wasn't actually a gangster. Yeah. He was actually a preacher's son or something. Right. Which is the funniest thing ever because he's 50 Cent's the biggest troll. Right. And he said he couldn't keep up the persona mm-hmm. because when times got tough, he wasn't really a gangster. He went back to his, he his just reverted. Self, yeah. He just reverted back. Right. And I'm just thinking some of us, like even myself, yeah. where I'm getting to a point in business, in work, where sometimes I feel like... I might be my old self. Right. But when I try to get to my old self, right, it feels so unfamiliar. And what I am now right. is the new normal because right. I've just been you've been hating it so hard. Yeah, you've been, been doing changing, it so much. Right? Yeah. yeah. Like having conversations, talking to people that you don't know, getting in uncomfortable positions to have somebody say yes or somebody to say no. Right. Or saying no to somebody before I was a people pleaser saying yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. And it all came down to breaking down communication. Right. What are communication styles? What are person personality styles? Right. And now it's come to the point of, okay, you know what? I am the person I am. I don't mm-hmm. need to tell my story from what I was. Right. You're a new person. There's yeah. no story. Yeah. I oh. I call it like the 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 onion sh- uh, shedding its layer. Yeah. Because I think even like when you're trying to change who you are, like let's say I went from back when I was losing weight or gaining weight, when when I lost weight, I went from 200 pounds to like 140. Yep. I have to become a different person, right? So I think uh, it is a level of development, but it's almost like destruction. You have to kill this old version of yourself yeah. to become this new version that is all the, the things that you want to be. And I, I also think, um, like to stretch that even further, I think a lot of people that are unhappy mm-hmm. are unhappy because they're not allowing themselves to change. Like they're clinging, they're working so hard to cling on to this comfort of who they, they used to be yeah, what if it's their surroundings or if it's them that's holding themselves back? Combination, yeah, combination of factors. You have to know kind of what it is. But when you try to hold on to something you you were, mm-hmm. you're not letting yourself become this new person, and that causes this depression, right? Um, are you familiar with the Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Have you ever yeah. looked into that? You have like the the pyramid. Yeah, the pyramid. yeah so I think basic each, is like um, food, physiological, housing, safety, safety. Yeah. Then uh, I, well, I don't. What know was it called? Top is when you're completely wealthy. Self self actualization. Uh, I don't remember all this all the steps, but I think each part of life, at least for me, I can talk about myself. Is I felt like I was first. It was like the physiological safety. Then it was like love. Then it was like self-esteem. Mm. And then now I feel like I'm finally getting to the point where now I'm comfortable making videos, putting myself out there, where I'm actually chasing this. Who, who am I supposed to be? Who I was, who yeah. I was born to be? 
And so it's kind of like a coming to myself moment, right? Like, uh, I think with that, you have to hit certain points in your life. For sure. It happened with me. Yeah. My, I think everyone hits that. I don't know. But for me, it was my relationship with money. Yeah. Working, going to university. Right. Getting out, getting a management job. Right. And then having a dollar value associated to a position. Right. Which was me. And I would march around talking about that position right and were you were you scarce with money or were you more like free or abundant or are you just talking about like social status you thought your value was tied to money yeah value was tied to money yeah that okay i'm worth x amount of dollars and when i got into real estate right my mindset was okay based on my previous job this is all i'm worth right and it took me a long time to overcome that yeah and once i overcame it i was thinking Man, what was I so scared of? Why was I so scared of breaking, breaking something that was just like non-existent? Right. And there's so much more potential just overcoming all of that. And once I was overcome, it was easy. Yeah. It was just moving on from one thing to the next thing. Right. And then talking about it to other people, they have that same block in their mind. And I'm saying, something needs to give them. I'm like, once you, once you just overcome it by a little bit, you'll understand that there's this much more time left in the year. Right. And if you're going to hit one more deal or one Whatever. more business transaction, right. one more relationship. Do you think there needs to be uh, like a catalyst in your life to cause that to happen? Like I, I talked to you about this this morning where when I was in the States for a couple of years, mm-hmm. my success, who I was as a person was tied to my, my work, was tied to this company I worked for for seven years. Yeah. So when I made that decision to come home, it was really hard. And I had friends that really encouraged me to do this and yeah. even leap and go into business for myself. Yeah. So that catalyst was, it was more painful not being true to myself yeah. that it forced me to be comfortable with the uncertainty. Um, right, right, you, right, I don't, right. Did you have a catalyst that made you go to that point? Or did you just say, oh yeah, this is slightly uncomfortable, I'll change. Because I, I think for most people, it needs to be like heavy discomfort. And then they're like, now I'm changing. Mm-hmm. I it, cannot tolerate this anymore. It was. It was a group effort of everybody talking about their goals. Right. And then everybody just doubling it or tripling it. Right. I'm going to make $15,000 in, right. in in the next two months. Right. Which at the time was a lot of money. Right. But then instead of 15, it was like 40 in two months. And I was right. like, like, I'm in control. Yeah. The control is all in my hands. It has nothing to do with... Right. Other people's ideas about putting two and two together. Right. I have to do it for myself. Right. And that was hard to come by because I thought everything, not everything should be given, but it would be a lot easier than it was. Right. And when it wasn't, right, my mindset kind of got shattered. Right. I was thinking, what the heck, man? I thought that was going to be easy. easy yeah. I'm such a likable person. You, okay. But now that you look back, do you think it was hard? I don't think or it was do you think hard. It was easy? Or do you think it was simple? It's not easy. I think it's very simple. Yeah. So I look back and like, why did I stress so much? It was easier it was than I thought. Guidance. There was less, or or we didn't think we were good enough. If, That's what it was. It's a combination. Yeah. Like part of part of growing up as an immigrant is being scarce, right? Like not mm-hmm. sure you have enough, and the, you know, feeling like it's never enough. And I think all everyone goes through this, and they get to a point where like, oh no, I have enough. Yeah. I am enough and I have enough. And then you like finally let yourself be the person. You know what? I don't think our, I think when our parents came here, they were completely untapped because they probably had to tell themselves that we have to make it or we die. Right. There was nothing in between for us. We have, um, I actually think we get it worse though, to be honest, because they, because them it's just survival for us. It's like, We've been handed this golden ticket. We and if we don't do anything country, with it, then, then we're we'll letting that down. Right? So I actually think we have it worse, right? Yeah, because now now in the back of our heads is, how do we- Our eat? parents, like the over- failure is like, oh, okay, yeah, you're an immigrant. You have an escape. You have Whereas a- we a- don't a- have, a- yeah, we don't have a cop out. We're like, oh, we got of all our relatives back at home in India, Punjab, wherever. Yeah. We're the ones that got lucky. Our parents moved here. We were born here. We were raised here, whatever it was. Yeah. So we have all had all the liberties. So now it's like, oh, pressure's on. Mm-hmm. So I actually think, yeah, I think we have it harder, but I think oh, it's a good thing. I wonder if it gets you more focused. Well, oh, yeah. I, like I see some of the younger guys, they're not focused at all. They're, they're like, my younger brother has a car. I didn't have a car until I graduated. Okay, you know? so when you- I was broke. My car broke down. My it, car broke down on Alex Fraser. Oh, that's the worst. If I pulled over, car was overheating. I turned off the car, sat there for 10 minutes. I'm like, how am I going to make, I had class at UBC. Yeah. Like, how am I going to make it to school? Yeah. 
waited for 10 minutes, turned it back on, made it to school, got home. On the way home, back up Alex Fraser, if you're coming on the way back, you go uphill. Yeah. My car was going 40. Wouldn't go past 40. Wouldn't. And everyone's behind me honking like crazy. Yeah, of course they were. I pulled off into Sunstone, same thing, paused 10 minutes, turn it back on, got home. Yeah. And car never started after that, but I made it there and back, but it never started after that. The oh, alternator did, one. Did you get late for class? <laughs> uh, I had to leave, it was like two hours. I left super early. Yeah. I, okay. I had made it just on time, but uh, got it, yeah. Got out. But, but when I got back, the car just never started again. We had the whole, I didn't even know something in the engine replaced and I sold it. So your experience when you moved from here to uh, the States, yeah. did you have that mindset when you went there? I don't know anybody. There's nobody around me. All I have to do is focus on work. And then it, that kind no, of- No, because I always was, because I was always doing this, the summer sales where I was always leaving for six months. Yeah. I always had that mindset. So for like the last five years, I'd already- you're already used to, I'd always used to been like, I'm separated. This is, I'm running a business, right? You're running a business. So it didn't create that space for me, but my vision for America was America is a part of my journey. Yeah. It's not the only thing I have because my grandma's getting old. I want to make sure I'm here for her and spend mm -hmm. time with her. But my vision for my life has been uh, like, I don't want to be limited by boundaries. It's a weird thing. I want to be able something to travel. With urgency? Did yeah. you have urgency of just, you only have limited six months, summer sales, and you have to just maybe for us yeah maybe for the summer sales but i mean in terms of like uh life like i don't want to be restricted i don't want to do business where i can't do business on my terms yeah but like right now we're we're having so like you know before after we recorded the morning podcast yeah my phone was blowing up and it's having a lot of stuff go crazy uh currently fighting with uh i don't want to go into too much detail but we're currently going back and forth with the city with bylaw mm -hmm. um and uh and while we're figuring that out, what really turned me off is I'm, I have to capitulate to a city's terms and it's fine because we're doing good work. And oh, now I have to work within his guidelines. And that inherently to me is like, wait, I can't do business on my terms. I almost don't want to do business in that city. Like it's, yeah, I don't know if that's, a, I don't know if it's like a pride thing, but to me, it's like, I want to like, especially if you're doing good work, like you should be able to practice business freely. Like. You should not be restricted on business. Now, I, I know why they have it. They want to protect consumers. Yeah. A lot of the right reasons. guidelines in place because it was people messing about, right? Yeah, that's what it is. So, like, some people... Somebody said, was not following the rules and all. It for everyone else. Everybody else is but getting the to me, to me, it's like, that's the point of becoming successful or doing well in business is mm -hmm. that you get to do business on your terms. So, I want to be able to go back to... So, again, I take it as an opportunity. I want to be able to go back in that city a year later. And they're like, we've done business with Rahul and his group and his yeah. team and his company. We would love to have them back here. So I want that kind of reputation. So actually I've worked with new builders and I worked with established builders, right? Yeah. The established builders, they say it's a piece of cake. Yeah. They, we go to the city, they give oh, us the papers. Right. They say, we don't know what the big deal is. Yeah. And then the new builders come in and they're like, this is wrong. That's wrong. We got yeah. yelled out. We got thrown out. We got to change our plans. And yeah. I'm always thinking, what did one do differently than the other? And most times they're not. It yeah. was just communication. Yeah. I posted something about this this morning. Yeah. And I read it briefly. It was about one of your friends working on overcoming a bylaw. And yeah. you went in, you read all 20 pages, yeah. just, found the solution. That's all it was. It up, was I, and brought it up to their yeah, attention so, and so got I'll, it done. I'll tell you exactly how that happened. Okay. He calls into the city and says, this is what we're going to do. And they turn around and say, no, we don't allow that. Yeah. I'm like, I, he, he calls me up frustrated. He's like, dude, they don't allow it. We've spent tons of money to make this happen, by the way. We yeah. spent 20, 30 grand on this. Yeah. So like it has to work. So I have a little bit of desperation because I'm the one. Yeah, money though. And money's yeah. been put in. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm connected, right? So I called the city and I'm like, hey, like this is what I've been told. Like what's going on? Mm -hmm. He's like, yeah, sorry, we that doesn't work f for our city. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, this is not what this one particular website says mm -hmm. he's like i don't know i gotta look at the bylaw i'm like okay let me call you back I get off the phone mm -hmm. i jump on the website pull up city bylaw do your own research 20 pages mm -hmm. i kid you not that's all it is i think it's i think it's on like the third page but i went through the entire 20 page of course i sent it back to him i emailed it to him because i got his email on the call yeah and i said mm -hmm. i know we talked about this i appreciate mm -hmm. that you took my call the bylaw says something totally different he calls me back like two minutes later yeah he's like i'm so sorry i was wrong yeah we're going to let you guys do it. Of course. And I was like, what the heck? I called up my, my, uh, my peer and I was like, dude, you, they're okay with it. Like, yeah, it was in the bylaw. Like they, yeah. he made a couple phone calls. 
other city i happened in other cities i talked to their uh, legal team and uh and then it's funny because they're trained solicitors so they're going through legal documents i'm just a dude reading bylaws and actually i learned this from my cousin because we had a variance dispute or not variance dispute uh, tax dispute property okay. tax yeah in vancouver yeah and i saw the amount of diligence he's like five years younger than me but i saw how diligent he was yeah and the uh appeal and how much detail he put in yeah as if I'm, and what I realized, if, if I'm not that diligent, how could I expect results the way he gets them? Of course. And I, it was actually from him. So it's, it's funny. I learned so much from these young guys because they, they have like, again, they have that. Remember, we were talking about this this morning, the, the innocence. Yeah. They have that innocent outlook of like, they don't, they're not scathed. They don't feel like the world's against them. No. Nope. They feel like things are there to serve them. And I think that's true with the world. The world is trying to serve us. I agree. And so now it's like, every time something goes wrong, I'm like, where is the world trying to serve me? What if, what's the lesson I'm supposed to learn here? Yeah. But it, you have to go through some trauma, I think. <laughs> I, I, I actually like what you did. Yeah. Right? You, you're playing by the rules. Yeah. Because here's the thing. This is, a, this is the first thing that comes to mind when somebody tells me no. Right. I'm thinking this person is either overworked. Right. It's why they're in the mood of just saying no. Right. Or they overlooked something. Right. That should be benefiting me. Right. And what's my job next? My job is to not to prove them wrong. Right. Is to actually point out, oh, right. hey, I'm going to do some research. Right. I'll follow up with you. And right. then I'll actually take those screenshots or photocopy or and highlight those uh, you do the key items. Yeah. Send it to them and For say, sure. hey, look, this is what I found. Can you For please sure. cross references? And sometimes they missed something. Right. Not because they're bad people and they want to oh. hurt us or shut us down. Right. It's because... They're human beings and right. they probably just missed it. They just missed it. It's literally a clerical error. That's it's human nature. They're not CPUs or we, AI. We don't expect perfection. And, yeah. that's what, and that's what I tell them. Like, uh, you know, well, even the message I said, you know, thanks for taking my call. Like, it's pretty rare. Like, you know, who? Get a who get, yeah. yeah be, be, but most people think it's like, dude, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're doing. Like, oh, that's wrong. Yeah. That's terrible. You, you turn people off. They don't want to yeah. help you. Now this guy is rooting for me. He's like, this guy went through the bylaw. Like he's, he's actually on my side. Yeah. So he's helping me, you know, get things done faster. It's cool. Yeah. I think if yeah. you, again, I always look at things and say, how is the, what is the world trying to show me? Yeah. And how is it trying to serve me? Of course. And it's, t it's just testing my resolve. The personal like, contact my, I made. In the meantime, that's that. Now he's an advocate for us, and, and now you have he's connecting me to someone else. And like, yeah, dude, it just yeah, yeah, it works that way, right? You're just uh, <clears throat> one of many situations. I pushed. I've this year more than the last few years. So ever since I detached from my identity, I was talking about when I came back from America. I've yeah. pushed myself in every part possible. Okay, uh, just like very intentional. Yeah, uh, because. What I realized is all this time I was playing it safe, playing it within my boundaries, not doing the things that I believed in because I was scared or I was afraid that things wouldn't work out. Yeah. And now I'm like, even if it doesn't work, I still am going to go for it now. So like, the yeah, like last year I bought two houses in the process of uh, buying a house, hopefully in the next few months. Yeah. Um, I went through my approval, all that. Uh, I made big investments into uh, the stock market. So like, there's a lot of things where I'm not playing it safe anymore. The no. video stuff, I'm making the shorts, I'm putting myself out there, I have to deal with criticism, all that. You know what, so, here's but, the thing, this is the way I see it. Right now, at our age, we can roll the dice. Oh, dude, yeah. I roll the dice? Yeah. Because I feel like money is so abundant, business right. is so readily available for us to just jump into. Yeah. That even if you do make a mistake, right. what's it going to really cost? Right. Thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. Right. But all of that can be replenished so quickly because money is readily available. Come to, yeah. It's, hey, but it's I think a it takes, weird feeling and a weird thinking to know that you're going to be okay, even if you're at zero. Yeah, yeah. It's a detachment from it, I think. It's like, because I, I always thought, okay, I want lots of money. Why? So I can have, I can feel secure. Security and freedom. Feel secure and do things I want to do. Then I'm, and I made decent money. And then I was like, it doesn't make me feel any more secure. No. The security has to come independent of the money. The money is just a tool. Yeah, it the is. security is your belief system and how you feel about yourself. Yeah, what do you think about yourself? How do you feel about yourself? How do you portray yourself? Those are like the important things. It goes back to we don't need bigger and better. Yeah. We just need the self actualization of That's, we yeah. are good enough. Yeah, and but we're it, fine with whatever means possible for sure. And I and even like down to the point where I think if there are certain things that you want, you don't have to like 
society teaches and there's a there's a really interesting port of a gary vaynerchuk like podcast that i was listening yeah. to and i was like dude i don't believe this but uh Saw your house sleep on the uh, sleep on the no, no, that's, that's, <laughs> i mean i've done a lot of that but no um he, he talks about uh oh it's not even him there's some other guy named uh i think his name's matt higgins okay i think i don't want I'll, maybe i'll correct myself later but uh he talks about something called society teaches incrementalism which is just a fancy way of saying people think they need to do a b and c to get to d oh yeah and society course. teaches that yeah but he says once you become aware you can just jump to d yeah and that's the interesting part and i've that's what i realize i'm like i keep trying to do a b c to get to d yeah why don't i just go for d if i want to make videos why do i have to feel like i'm good enough and bought enough houses and bought enough properties and made enough, and have enough information to go and do d yeah sharpening that path. yeah like i talked to my cousin again he's a great partner for this reason because when we're building he's doing all the legwork so i'm just the visionary i'm just like encouraging him but he's the brains yeah but i'm like like if the goal is to get into construction yeah. and building homes why do you need to flip properties and do this and do that long-term holes short just start building homes just go for it yeah the money's there you'll get construction loans the the city will help you the government like city of vancouver needs more homes like yeah. they're gonna encourage you the city will find a way to make it work for you because they need more homes and then he calls me up one day and i made a short about this where he's like you know what he's like you're right mm -hmm. he's like i'm not focused on the money i want the goal i'm like the goal will get you the money yeah yeah so you just gotta and the lesson, lessons along the way will teach you what you need to know anyways and way more why yeah more? and and i think that's the beauty right so that is part of the inherent beauty of of mentorship coaching leadership mm -hmm. is that everything you've learned you owe it to to your people your friends your network to mm -hmm. give it to them younger teach them at a younger age how to get ahead yeah or whatever every lesson you've learned i teach everyone around me about relationships m mistakes that i made uh, about uh, business transactions yeah. deals yep. i'm not perfect at it but i i've learned a thing or two and i help the health like it, my younger brother is you know whatever if i don't agree with how they fe look and feel it's like it's on my prerogative to actually help them it's an ob i almost feel like an obligation to do it do you think there's more people willing to go out of their way to help today than there was like 15 20 years ago 30 years ago I think there is the same amount, but I think there's, you see them more now because of technology. Yeah. Okay. Right. Like I think 50, hundred years ago, there's probably people that wanted to do life coaching, but they didn't have the reach. Now you have an iPhone that Except reaches. Dale Carnegie when he came out with a six right, but, tablet. But that's, what, that's what I mean. It's all just the same thing, but it's repackaged, right? Dale Carnegie existed back when, uh, John Maxwell, but now you have this generation's. Yeah uh youtubers all like people that are doing good work yeah that's crazy but, but they have a bigger reach yeah right like i can make a video reach a million people back then they would have to write a book and maybe someone reads the book yeah now it's like that video you can watch it a million times million different people and you only have to make it once yep and then you can Whereas the book needs to get printed and publishing press all yeah. that so just information is being spread way and faster. then the best thing is you can get a hundred people's feedback because they're making videos about the topic that was right. actually within that book yeah. and different viewpoints and perspectives and every arguments i mean right. when i talk about arguments i'm not talking about <laughs> putting people down yeah i'm talking about having debating. a healthy debate yeah so we should debate more find answers to the responses yeah we should debate way more i don't agree yes. man the medical facilities yeah. came out with covid stuff and i'm like i have to be a shadow ban i don't yeah yeah <laughs> i the thing is i don't just blindly follow things because someone tells me even if you're you you're a proposed expert i don't want your experience i tell people this all the time mm -hmm. people ask me for advice i'm like do you want to live my life or do you want to live your own yeah so i try to give them like foundation but not like i don't tell them like this is absolute i tell them here is what worked for me it may or may not work for you mm-hmm Here's where, why I based my decision, but you need to figure it out for yourself. What do you tell your sales guys when you're working in solar and you're working in the other departments and you're going door to door? Yeah. What's uh, one key to success? The sales guys? Yeah. Though, I don't know if there is a one key, but yeah, I think it's... What's uh, your main focus? Are you scripting more? Are you telling them to bang on more doors or hit the pavement? What is I it? mean, a, a little bit like you want to get better at the job, so you want to improve your skill. Yeah. Uh, I'm giving them a path, right? I'm, what I really focus on is vision. Like it's, 
It's not so much the day-to-day because the day-to-day you can provide training. We do sales training every day. Yep. One hour, guys will learn. That part is really easy to replicate. Mm-hmm. The vision casting mm-hmm. and actually showing them how you're planning and prepping long-term, right. that's, the, that's the part that's, that you have to have it, right? Uh, I had a team, uh, a management group. They did probably in revenue, probably like two and a half to five million, somewhere in that ballpark. Mm-hmm. I never calculate it because look at profits, but that's how much revenue they did uh, last summer. One office. Was that a, is that a big number in your industry? I think it's, it's okay. Like it's, it could be better, but for, uh, for how we quickly, we put things together. Yeah. It's it great. Was good. Okay. It's good. Um, so we didn't sacrifice anything. So they did really well, but now they're, because now they've done well, it's natural for them to get poached by other companies. Yeah. So, and that happens a lot in our industry. Cause like someone does well, you want the best talent working for your business. Of course. So now they're getting poached, but there's two things that I did that will retain them mm-hmm. in my, it, again, and it's genuine hearted. It's in their best interest. Uh, but one of them is transparency. Even before this happened, mm-hmm. I brought them in and said, this is how our business works. And I showed them all the numbers. Yeah. I showed them how much I get paid. I showed them how every, how much every, everyone in the business gets paid. There's yep. tr- total pay transparency. Right. Because now if they think about leaving, it's like, how do you leave someone that's literally showing you how much they're earning? Yeah. And in most cases, I will take less so that they can earn more and I'll invest into the program. Yep. But like, that's a leader that you're like, oh, I trust yeah. this guy. Yeah. The second thing is- Sustainable. Second thing is, is direction, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Is building a vision and then showing them our edge. Okay. And so mm-hmm. one of the edges that we have that maybe I think a lot of people in real estate know this subconsciously, we don't talk about it outwardly, mm-hmm. but- there's a million immigrants coming to Canada. I think last year there was a million. It was quite a bit, yeah. 150,000 in BC. Yeah. Canada has the same num- uh, number of immigrants coming in as the US, but the US's population is 10 times. Oh, it's 10 times, 10, 15 so times more. So what that tells me is there's this huge immigrant population that needs to be helped, serviced. They need jobs, yeah. they need places to live, they need services in the community, so the infrastructure needs to build. So those, that inherently, when you have your population spiking by a million yeah, and they're going to need high paying jobs, uh, they need houses to live in. You can already kind of predict so where it's going to go. Yeah. You can like, you can see, oh, it. if I create jobs for immigrants that are immigrant friendly, how does that industry not do well? If I yep. create uh, housing for immigrants, how does that not do well? If I create community or service for immigrants, how does that not do well? So you can actually like just by knowing that, right? And then again, this team is, they're not South Asian like I am. So I, they don't understand cultural narratives. <laughs> they don't understand what I know. Yeah. I know how brown people are. I know how emotions and yeah. uh, cultural ways, family, community, uh, stigmas, brown. all Asians, that. Or just people people that come from out of this country that we have, have that second and third language that they have to overcome and the barriers. Yeah. I know exactly how they feel. We, we and that's the thing, if we know, immigration population is high yeah. and we know a lot of them are South Asian or Asian mm-hmm. generally. And there's a lot of immigrants, but mostly South Asian. We see that. Yeah. Like we have this pool of talent of people we could solve problems for. Like there's just so much opportunity for us. And I had to show them that, look, this is what's happening. Yeah. Because I understand their culture, mm-hmm. I can better connect with them. We can grow our business faster. Yeah. That's an edge. Cause now it's, you get it? So if they're, they're not South Asian, but they know, oh yeah, he right. He's right. And I've shown, I've shown them this in person. It's empathy. It's, it's, yeah, it's just transparency, right? It's, yeah. it's knowing your edge, right? It's knowing, especially in business, because business is very competitive. It is. Well, what, what makes you different than anyone else is the first thing. Everyone's like, not everyone sells real estate, but like homes, right? A lot of people sell homes. Of course. So, but why, why should we buy one from you? Why should we buy one from you? And that's called your, they call this a blue ocean strategy. What makes you different? Yeah. Or the USB unique selling proposition. Yeah. Right. One or the that's other. What it is. Depending on which. What's your differentiator? That's why I'm like realtors, especially if you're in uh, uh, Delta Surrey, if you start doing videos in Hindi or Punjabi, you're capturing a market. It right? would be. Yeah. I've told a bunch of people this, but yeah, you should do it. And that's a goal. Yeah. yeah. Why make one video in English that's going to go after what you think is the demographic, right? Go after one that's just a very key niche. Yeah. And there's hundreds of thousands of people that want to deal with somebody that speaks in your own language. Dude, for sure. I have a, a realtor buddy that brought him here last time. Yeah. Likes you guys. He loves the environment. 
was like, let me show you how to door knock. So I took him. I know I don't never sold. Yeah, I've yeah. never sold the house. Yeah, but I went and started knocking on doors, and I showed him. Like we went to expired listings. I made him print out a letter and just showed him. Mm-hmm. He's like, bro, you you're not even a realtor, and you're pitching these people. I thought you were the real estate. Yeah, I, think. I, I was like, was and he's like, he's like, you you like they like you, they listen to you. It's not that bad. It's not scary. And he's like, it's really doable. And he's been knocking doors for the whole week yeah. without me. But I had to show him that first view, right? I think what happens is when people get into real estate, they forget that they need that they forget how to communicate with other human beings. Yeah. How do you forget to have a conversation? Yeah. <laughs> and, or like it's a barrier in their mind, right? Oh, like, like it must be so to- hard. Like they're the people are gonna be mad. It's like we knocked on a door and there's an Indian idea started pitching her and yeah. India started like RTG, aapka beta got it. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. It's like theatrics, right? Yeah. And she's like, nahi, beta de got it. And I was like, I, I know that you guys have tried to make a house in like, Miami is so bad too. Of course. <laughs> but it works. Because she's like, who is this like brown boy? He should speak the language, but he's whitewashed. Yeah. So like, I'm sure the psychology is hilarious. Yeah. Bad. But that's, but that's you know, my friend's like, bro, you don't know how to sell a house. Uh, yeah, so I was like selling a house. Yeah. It has to do with a human uh, connection. Yeah, I was like, I'm just a consultant. You know, I just help my friend. He's the realtor. Yeah. <laughs> so it's so funny. Dude, you should, yeah, some of the experiences I have, I do a lot of shit just for yeah. fun. I actually, uh, there's this video I've been working on. I would love for you to help with this video, actually. I'll help with the video. I think you would, you would crush it. Uh, this video is actually more of a stage video. It's called, uh, it's called, I don't know what it's, I'm going to call the video name yet, but. We don't have any names. We have all these ideas. There's no name. No, this is a good one. This is a good one. Cool. Actually, I want you to evaluate this idea. The, the video that I'm going to make uh, is about Vancouver being a lonely city. So there's this, I have a friend oh, okay, that cool. told me about this Reddit thread. It said, Vancouver is a lonely city. People don't get along. People don't make friends. So to test it, I went to craft a uh, coffee shop in New West. Okay. And I walked in there and I can't t- turn. I think she's the owner. Yeah. I was like, she got me a copy. I was like, can I ask you a question? She's yeah. like, yeah. I'm like, is Vancouver a lonely city? And she's yeah. like, I don't know. I don't think so. And like, we're talking back and forth. And then I asked her colleague, yeah. who's a immigrant here uh, from Ukraine. And I started talking to her. I'm like, is Vancouver a lonely city? She's like, heck yeah. Yeah, man. Vancouver is that's the lonely so city. And, and that's where I'm like, is this a real problem? And can we solve the problem? So now I want to make this video about uh validating or proving whether or not vancouver is a lonely city so i actually want to go and ask people like on the street like hey do you think vancouver is a lonely city and okay. so i want to do that out of fun and then i have to set other ideas actually i don't, shouldn't even say this because people steal my ideas okay no keep, <laughs> it, keep it under wraps until no, but, we ex- yeah until yeah. we do a big yeah. nice brand opening but that was the idea what do you think of um it? i think it's a great idea first off i don't think you want to help me i can help you man we'll talk to whoever you want to <laughs> here's the thing i don't think any city or any place is more lonely than the other dude it comes down to uh, it comes down to perspective <laughs> right i've never gone somewhere and yeah. not been able to talk been to able someone. to talk somebody and i've right. traveled right. around the world and i've never eaten alone right so i so when i follow up that question because i'm like i'm a social guy we we know how to connect with people this is the this is the response i usually get mm-hmm. is that and this is what the Reddit thread said. Mm-hmm. They're like, I was in Texas. I made a friend. Mm-hmm. We stayed in touch for years. Okay. I'm in Vancouver. I made a friend. The friendship fizzled out within a day. That's what okay. they, so I'm not saying lonely in the sense of like, you're by yourself. You can't make friends. Like yeah. it is just, you have to work extra hard. And, and I would say we have an advantage because we're South Asian. We live in North Delta Surrey yeah. where it's predominantly South Asians. Even when you go to Vancouver, South Asians everywhere. Yeah. So that's, that's why I don't know if it's totally true or not because I don't have the perspective of an immigrant. You know what the thing is? I think what's happened is there's more people that have talked about not being able to make friends right. in Vancouver than people coming out and saying, this is the greatest place on earth. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, that's why I want to test it. Yeah, I he- if, you go to, if you go to different countries- Dude, I messaged I message Chip Whatever. Wilson. The oh, did you message him? On TikTok. Oh, <laughs> did he respond? No, he, no, it was a, I can't message him because he's too popular. So I can't. Yeah, he's probably got DMs, it. But, of them. So I commented on his video. Hey, Chip. Yeah. I was like, you don't look like the person I thought you'd look like. Because <laughs> he's the founder of Lululemon. Yeah, he is. But he doesn't look like the founder of Lululemon. <laughs> well, that's me ju- judging, right? It's me stereotyping. That, I expected like a fit guy. That's him but, being a master marketer. Dude, and uh, finding, 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 I love that, man. I'm a business guy, dude. I'm like, find a need for somebody that he actually created, understand. he created a need for something that was non-existent. Yeah. Right. Oh, and oh, that's what all our thinkers are doing. Yeah. Or, or the need was there and he 
he understood. Because, well, because like, I would say his... But stretchy pads, were they really a need? For the fitness community? Was it really a need? I, I mean, know. can you not work out without stretchy pads? I mean, nothing's a need, right? Most things in stuff yeah. aren't a need. They're it built off of wants. It's a want. It wasn't a need. I think a great business, all, all great businesses are wants, by the way, I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right? And, but, like, yeah. I'm going to go down a rabbit hole with this closing. Line. Don't, don't, don't diss them because I want them. I'm not going to diss them. I'm not all. <laughs> if you're listening to this, we need to visit your house. Yeah. How much would a yeah, right. $3 million house look like? <laughs> Overinflated house of yours. <laughs> you're going to make a way. This is, this is my thought. Okay. Google Maps shows a tennis court. Yeah, yeah, guy. yeah. I mean, he's got a tennis. I can't hate on the guy. I was just thinking when you're when we're talking about like a need, is there really a need for stretchy pants, right? Okay, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I need stretchy pants. Maybe, maybe there is, right? Uh, but now we've come down to a society and a world where we're paying hundreds of thousands, if not million dollars for a Birkin bag. Yeah. Is it really a necessity or is it just really just more popularity contest of- Dude, all the girls it? are going to hate you. Who can get it? All the girls are, are going to be like, Karn, man, I was, we were attracted to Karn until he said he's <laughs> not going to buy us a Birkin bag. Birkin bag? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm not going to buy it. Hey, you know what? Actually, those are, those are one of the rare occasions where I'd be, where I'm okay spending half a million dollars on a purse or a bag. Right. Seal it up, throw it in a locker, don't touch it for a year, bring it and back out. It goes up. And it's a million dollars. I've made it, I've, I've doubled them. I've doubled it. If the world is going to SHIT. I don't know if that purse sells for that much. I think it depends on the condition of the world. Yeah. So like, I always wonder that because you had these NFTs that were selling for a quarter million, half a million. NFTs million. are weird. I and then they came and went so quick. Are they gone now? I mean, like they're a dollar. Oh yeah, that's true. They're not half a, like I think Logan Paul paid X million, right? I think the market for collectibles is one of those weird spaces where it's demand based, right? Supply and demand based. Yeah. So supply was low, demand was high. Now it's reverse where demand is high and supply is low, so they're not worth much. But I think it's now, uh, it's, gone, now it's gone from well, they don't solve a utility, right? They don't have any actual purpose other than I've got this NFT that you can't have, even though it's a picture. But it's, it's just a picture, and then there's some sort code. of code. It's code based. Whatever. No, I think that is the future. Whatever credentials they're getting, pinning it on their Twitter page, like I have no idea. Yeah, but it's gone from that going back into like baseball cards and actual. Items physical? That, f- physical items that yeah. are being traded. Like Charizards and Pokemon cards. Yeah, I cool. sometimes go to the the Sotheby's website yeah. and I look at all the items that are being auctioned right. that are vintage items or signed or, or something like, that from the early 18 or 1900s. And right. it's absolutely amazing. Yeah, I always thought that it's was history. so interesting. It is history, but yeah, I don't know. I haven't like properly sat on collectibles, like the I, my, my feelings no. about it because I always think like, most material things in this world you'll have for a period of your life. And I know this because when I bought my house in Vancouver, yeah. all the stuff was in the house. Yeah. And this old couple lived in this house, had the nicest things. He, I think he had a good professional career. And I think he was a dentist, uh, but got old. Kids didn't even want to empty the house. They left everything in the house. They left it. Jackets, the nicest stuff, uh, everything they had in the house was just left. And so it didn't end up mattering. So you could spend years collecting. But then the, the the collectibles get traded for money at some point. Yeah. And then you spend the money, maybe, or you pass it down. You pass it down. You, it's... I don't know. So some, that, I always question like that. I'm like, created. yeah, so like you have a piece of history up until it's your time to go. Then I guess what? When it's time to go, if all, all you care about is your health. Yeah. Am I healthy? It's Can I live longer? Disposable income. Also, yeah. this is all the stuff that's just curated by greed. Yeah. Is right. what, how much more can I accumulate? And I talk about yeah. accumulation all the time. Yeah. How much more can you have to be satisfied or yeah. to satisfy that need? Right. I have you looked into minimalism? I'm a minimalist. Are you actually a minimalist? Like you come over, I don't have a, yeah. You will be like, holy shit, dude, you look like this. Yeah. I have a, I have a bed. I have a, my charging cables. I have yeah. Those. I have my table and a chair. No, and my kitchen stuff. in your house. Do you? Do you? No, 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 no. Okay. Like I have a proper bed and yeah. like proper computer table and like yeah, I, spent, I spent like a lot of money on my computer desk and my bed and stuff because yeah. i'm thinking but I the thing is uh, but i'm but i'm actually like a true ma- i and, and it's not for that it's not like i'm a minimalist because i want to be a minimalist so like, yeah. i things make me feel claustrophobic right when i have too much of something i feel like i'm stifled it's yeah. because when i grew up my parents well, i love them and my family we have a garage full of stuff Yep. And, I, and half of it doesn't get used. I hate that. Half of it? 90% of it doesn't Bro, get used. Yeah. And I'm like, why do we have this? We don't even park your cars in the garage. And the brown person that can use it for parking a vehicle. Yeah. So, but the, to me, that's like, why? 
it's like this hoarding mentality, like hold on to things. I'm like, yo, when you go, you're not going to hold on to it. And that's the same feeling I had with the house. When, when we got into the house, uh, I walked in and I just saw all the stuff. And I'm like, and it, it was no, and it just and it was no use to them, and it's no use. To no me. use to you, yeah. Were you so, going to donate any of it? Recycle it? Actually, it's kind of cool. We did donate a, a huge uh, portion of the stuff, but we did a massive garage sale at the house. Yeah. All the neighbors came over. We said first item free. They all started grabbing items. Yeah. And so they would bring a bag full of stuff and say, "I want all this. How much for all this?" I'm like, "What do you want to pay?" Yeah. And they're like, 50 bucks." I'm like, "Sure." Yeah. Whatever they said. Yeah. I said yes. I didn't care. Of course not. Because I was going to throw it all up. You needed it gone. I needed it gone. So I was yeah. like, just the cost of bringing a bin would have cost more. Yeah. So we, yeah, we had to do that anyways. But the that is nice to make fun of the neighbors, especially when you're doing construction Dude, around we there. Did yeah. a, we posted a Facebook ad yeah. and promoted. We paid to promote it. Yeah. The whole neighborhood knows we're doing this. Yeah. And we carried stuff. Now we have friends in the community. Yeah. For things that to me are worthless and to them it could be gold. And they they feel like they've paid a fair price. I'm happy to do that. Yeah. Whenever I sell something on online, marketplace mm -hmm. or anything, I want it gone. So like mm -hmm. for me, if I look for opportunities to give and they negotiate 20 bucks, 30 bucks, yeah. I'm like whatever, man. It's okay, yeah, sure. Just take it. I want the I want the relationship. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, who knows, man? This comes around down the road. They end up doing something. I sold a, a mic. They end up doing something down the road and we and they remember me. Mm. And I'm like, cool. And like, you never know, man. You That's my know. biggest thing. It always comes back around. That's my biggest thing. I don't want anybody to ever feel ripped off. Yeah. Or feel bad or feel like they lost or feel like I strong armed them. Yeah. I want this should be a win win. Yeah, I want it. I want them to feel good about whatever they purchased or whatever they sold. Yeah. Instead of just grinding them to the penny. Right. And I know that's how a lot of people, not a lot of people, I yeah. say people do business because that's the way they're taught. Yeah. Is it right? I don't know if it's right. Does it leave some people feeling a little unsettled? Right. right. Probably it can. Does. Yeah. Because I know I've had that feeling when I was younger and I right. found out like, oh man, I totally got taken advantage of. Right. Right. And I said, I don't want the next person to feel this way, so I'm just going to do things differently. Yeah. And then whoever I'm working and with, I just pass that information And it's on. cool, because then I also, like, I, I'm a firm, firm believer, and I guess this is like non-proven stuff, right? I give out deals, which means I get deals. 100%. Right? It's just like some weird law. Money, if, dude, it's a if I'm like, law. It's a and I, it almost law. comes back better, right? If I'm, if I'm more giving, yep. then I just get more. Yeah. And it's like, if I give out more deals, then I will get more more deal. I 100% I believe that. So it's like this weird, yeah. I don't know. If you, I don't know if they're directly connected, but I just get. Oh, they're 100% connected. Things happen. I'm just like, how did this happen? I, I mean, met you. If you wake up in the morning. And I end up winning, not like in a competitive sense, but like I end up getting the better end. Or You it, always walk away one, yeah. either a feeling better for yeah. doing something that you thought was legitimately good. Right. And they felt good because they're going to compliment you back. That automatically for sure. increases your uh, endorphins. Yeah. And then. The I, universe is going to reward you. And I have moments of regret. And my regret moments are totally weird. I was at the Starbucks down the street here. Sure. And uh, when I was at the Starbucks, I walked in, ordered my drink, whatever. I got a coffee and I forgot my wallet in the car. Mm -hmm. So I was like, hang on. I go, let me go grab my wallet. I go back, grab my wallet. And as I come in, there's another pair ordering. Mm -hmm. And the lady stops and she, she says, oh, he was here first. Mm -hmm. uh, I've already made his drink. I'm just going to charge him. And the other two girls are like, oh, yeah, for sure. Let him in. Yeah. And and I just wasn't aware at that time, but I should have paid for the drink. You should have paid for the drink. I know. I messed up. I've done that. I messed up. And I had that moment. Yeah. And it was already too late. And yeah. I already walked back, already paid. But now, and then I sat down. I was like, why didn't I pay for the drinks? There was some. I don't know why. Sometimes just like. It didn't click. I don't know. Whatever it was. So I regret, but I have those regrets where I'm like, I could have done something it's nice. So on. And it would have just been such a nice gesture. Yeah. And I missed the window. Because it makes the other person's day. And there's nothing and it's, that you want in return or get in return. It's, it's magical. Yeah, and I and I was actually so upset for the next hour. Not like beating myself up, but I was thinking about. Yeah. It. I was like, I will try not to miss those windows. Yeah, I often in those situations, more often than not, anybody that's behind the counter, yeah, I'll always try to just make them laugh. Right, yeah. just inherently in me that I'll just have a conversation. Have a conversation. And they're like, "How are you?" And you say, "How are you?" And they're like. You just ask yeah, me how yeah. I'm doing? Yeah. What? They, they actually stop. It's like the whole world changes. So I was eating that burrito just earlier. Yeah. And I was at Mucho Burrito just down the street. Yeah. As soon as I, I came in and I'm always like, okay, I'm a vegetarian. And she said, there's an additional uh, tofu if you want to add that in for the protein. Right. I said, sure. Have you had it? Yeah. She said, no, I, I mainly have only had ever had the meats. Right. I said, good. 
I'm like, I'll eat it for the both of us and we'll have a shared experience about it. Yeah. She started laughing. She's like, that's the weirdest thing I've ever heard. Yeah. And she starts giggling and I'm like, your mood just changed Change, right now. Yeah. Dude, and it's amazing. By the time we got to the till, she says, oh man, you know what? You have a like super awesome day. Yeah. I think, who says super awesome? awesome and I yeah. said, you know, awesome Dude. would have done, yeah. but super awesome, good day. Day, yeah. yeah. So that's like four adjectives to and describe that food, your day. I swear to God, that <laughs> it was better. It, was it tasted better. It tasted so good. I finished that entire thing. I wasn't even that hungry. I only wanted half a sandwich. Dude, it's so true. Or the half yeah. a burrito. The world's a reflection, man. But I ate the entire thing and yeah. it was, I I honestly believe that the kindness I use, the love you out of yeah. your brain, out of your heart, out of your mouth, yeah. it goes into the food. Yeah. Because there's molecules that are getting warmed up, yeah. all gooey and Dude, fuzzy, knows, night man. juices are flowing. We, we don't understand metaphysical stuff, but like, yeah, I mean, we understand what science tells us, but who knows? Energy is a real thing. Energy is a real thing. And if, you know, if moment to moment conservation of energy has to exist, yep, thought has energy. And so, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Again, it's poorly understood. I don't want to speculate on this. We're not in that in that kind of a business, but it would be interesting to all of that there, business. Right? I do. I'm, yeah. I'm all about the hokey pokey stuff, dude. I, I yeah, hocus pocus and the goodness <laughs> and the love, dude. I yeah, spread I'm as make, much kind as possible. For the longest time, I didn't think I was spiritual, and I wasn't. But uh, yeah, I think spiritual or religious, spiritual. Like I like even young people were like, oh, are you spiritual? I'd be like, nah, I'm a science guy, you know. But as I got older, I became more spiritual. Yeah, way more spiritual now than than science. Actually, it's and again, yeah, like it's one of those questions, right? I saw this Andrew Tate podcast where someone asked him, "Does luck exist?" And and then it does. and then so he goes, he goes, "Well, does it not exist?" And I think you can't prove that luck exists. Yeah, or luck does not exist. So you can't say whether or not it exists. Yeah, you can say I don't know. The the correct answer is I don't know. Can you say can you say for a fact that luck exists? The answer is no. Can you say for a fact that luck doesn't exist? The answer is still no. Still no. So does the luck exist? The the correct answer is I don't know. Yeah. Because we don't know. But he he said this thing where like, if you believe your, which way is better? He's like, ultimately, if you have to believe something, yeah. do you think you'll get more out of life or whatever if you believe you're lucky? And of course. Yeah. hundred percent. If you just believe luck exists, then you'll get more lucky. Yeah. So I don't, but I don't, I don't want to give that power to luck, which is like a level of coincidence. Well, I give it give to, me a power. Or I give it, I just say there's the world is guiding so i it's more like that's the spiritual part where the metaphysics and the yeah universe. it's like the world is trying to get me what i want and vice versa if i'm trying to serve the world with a genuine heart the world's also trying to do the same yeah thing. i believe in luck yeah i think it's hard, call it luck, i yeah. think it's hard work and opportunity <laughs> when they meet at a crossroads yeah you get lucky so i man i've been struggling with the hard work thing the hard work thing. I've been I'm not, struggling with I'm not saying hard work like you need to pick up a shovel and a hammer and you have <laughs> to work out in the sun. Yeah. I'm saying being in, intentional with your time. That I agree with. Yeah. Because I think the hard, the hard work is goes back to just my mind always. And I think most people think like work 12, 13 no, hours a day. And no, because like, if they work no. hard, if, if that's what we call hard work, then they should be the richest. Yeah. No, people out there, but it's not, you know, not. people that are shoveling or whatever. It's the people that are intentional, intentional with their that's, time. That's what it is. It's or understanding. It's, that's what understanding it is. things, right? It's it's how do I get more done with less effort and less time, yeah. right? Because uh, and this is what I think the middle class is really taught to believe. This so I had this conversation with a friend earlier this morning, where CEOs of companies say we work hard. They work the least hardest. Oh yeah, I think there's right? like this, they're working hard. They're not yeah. actually working hard. Right, but they collectively they work hard enough for all to kind of come together. Right, but a CEO is not working as hard as a janitor. I just know the level of effort in the work they're doing is yes. not the same. You can't compare the two. But again, when they're so public, the it's very like it's very highlight real. Like yeah, I worked hard, I slept on couches, this and that. But it's like you did that for two years, and now you're like in a cushy mansion. Yeah, and things are good. So. So I when we're talking about hard work, hard work gets like, um, sorry to, yeah, no, no, but hard work gets like, uh, all this praise, right? But yeah. it's like the people that are winning at the highest level, they don't work hard. They work intentionally. In, they work smart. They work, work smart. Oh yeah. They get more done with less effort and less time. So I get a question all the time. Corn, how do you get so much done in like such little time? And right. we just see you laughing and talking and hanging out all the time. Right. And I'm saying, because I work really hard and they're right. like, you're never working though. Right. When I said, you don't understand that after right. you guys go home at four or five o'clock, we're still going, I'm still going. That's right. when I start training and start learning and I start practicing and right. preparing for the next day. So right. when I come into the office, 
the thing that's going to take me an hour or two hours is going to take you guys eight hours to do right so because they block off their day whereas we're willing to work more often yeah well i'm, so I, I'm I, opening in addition to i am i almost question because like i always think about the opposite where people go into work at nine come out at five they check out they do their life where mm -hmm. those their schedule it's forcing them to be this way of course whereas because we have accountability we feel we feel an onus and are willing to give up more of our own time to do yep. things so then, that, then to me, it's like, is that hard work or is that just intentional? We're just aware and we want yeah, to do Yeah, things. it's more intentional. Do we enjoy, is there a level of satisfaction we also get from it that other people don't? Yeah. Um, so, and then it just becomes a different personalities and you see different people. I think it comes down to preparedness. Yeah. Right. People say they work hard for eight hours and I'm thinking, I don't think you worked hard for eight hours. I think right. you just, if you actually- You just made stretchy pants, Chip. Yeah, man, <laughs> stretchy pants. <laughs> hey, you know what, Lululemon, I liked, I actually liked their quality of fabric before, mm. 10 years ago, 15 years yeah. ago. Yeah, and they would sw swap it out over a counter, right? I, I think that was one of the things. I don't like, like. I don't like it now, the quality's gone down. They, they're like, they were like, I don't know, can't compare them now, but they were like Apple. Remember Apple when they first came out, you break your phone, they'll replace it for free? Yeah, it's all service, yeah. It's all, now they, you have to pay for it. But same with Lululemon, it was like, you rip your pants 10 years later, we'll come and give you a free pair. But people take advantage of it and then they stop doing and that. And then they stop doing that, yeah. And because they're very expensive to do. Because you know what happened is they had to get enough market <laughs> share and right. enough buy-in. That's how you do it. That you over time, they assert, these are mathematical equations, yeah. right? They've done the numbers, we ran it. They said if- How many people would- How many it, people yeah. over how many sales do we have to give up that one free pants? Right. And how's that going to hit our bottom line? Right. After we hit our bottom line after so many years, how many customers have we helped? Right. How many people came back? And when can we stop this or dilute <laughs> the quality of it right. and actually make it cheaper for more people to uh, for more people to be accessible to? Right. I think whenever companies get too big and they become public, they're no longer like their own. They don't make their own decisions. Oh, they're done. I think they. That's when their quality starts to go down because then it just becomes a numbers game, right? Yeah. Right. At that not point, it's not. Uh, it's not even a company. It's a soulless engine, right? It's not. Uh, it well, it is a company, but it's not people. It's this machine. Yeah. And the machine churns, and you no longer like every employee used to be like you would know the CEO and the, you have a relationship. But now, if you want to get so big, you're just a number. Right? You're just an employee number ten in this company. Employee number one hundred and fifty. Employee number thousand. Right. And then that's when the quality goes down. You start to lose some of the the backyard feel it happens with all of them Every, when you're scaling businesses. yeah depending on how quickly you're going to scale right you're gonna there's going to be more anonymity between yeah. people between i like that word the, yeah hierarchy i guess if you want to be anonymous yeah but anonymous is is i guess is the an anonymity might be the wrong term for this because right. that's you trying to be outside or right. be within a bunch of people without being noticed or seen. Yeah, yeah. But I think like people you're... are left unseen in those right. situations. What term are we using for that? Yeah. Uh, like, yeah, it's not anonymity. Yeah, anonymity not... is conscious and in intentional. Yeah. Uh, but this is more like you're, you kind of blend in, right? Yeah. I everybody's, uh, yeah, everybody's blended. But I like that word anonymity. Yeah. Because, I guess because of, bureau, a because of bureaucracy. Do you have a vocabulary list that you try to hit? Uh, that I try every day? Maybe we should do that. Don't you think? We should be doing it. Like Stephen, a, Stephen A. Smith always shouting out random words. I don't know if you've ever seen his. <laughs> he's always just you're like, he's always yelling too and just like this agitated fella. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like his style of commentating. I mean, it's, it's, it's it's a certain brand for certain people that yeah. like that kind it's of entry, It's just like rowdy entertainment. But it's just, it's, he's over the top for no reason. He, <laughs> uh, you know what? Here's the thing. When he's off camera, yeah. he's it's actually like a calm guy. Yeah. He speaks very politely. Yeah, I think when he's on TV, that character comes in, kicks it's in. It's the selling mentality. So he right? can't, you can't keep that up yeah. for 12 or 13 or 16 hours yeah. of thing. And, yeah, and again, it's his performance is tied to how much viewership. So he has to animate and... Yeah, all things out left, right, center. He's never. Yeah, this needs to happen. And this is a move on from player. Stephen A. Smith. Good <laughs> guy. I was gonna say, um, going back to CEOs. Yeah, Joe Boxer. You know what the underwear company? I don't know who that is, but so no. the 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 CEO for Joe Boxer. All right. He was selling Joe Boxer underwear everywhere. Right, super successful brand. Right, and what ended up happening was they hit a tipping point. Right. And they got a board of directors. They were trying to find a different, what type of direction to go in. Right. Meanwhile, Joe Boxer, the CEO himself, I can't remember his name. I don't know if it's Joe Boxer or what it is. Right. Joe, whatever. Yeah. 
he was spending hundreds of thousands of dollars of doing crazy things for marketing, thinking it's going to help him. Right. For example, he would jump, he would get into a plane. Right. And what they would do is fly over a city and just dump a bunch of underwear from out the, the door and he would right. parachute out. Right. And here's Joe Boxer and he, they're thinking, this is a fun little marketing play that they're going to do. Right. And what they ended up doing was they're like, this, this person is a madman. We got to yeah. get him out of here because he's just going to burn through all the reserves. Right. So they kick him off. They restructure how they're going to start marketing and they finally got him, got the company back on track. But they're like, you be you. We'll give you like, here's some like play money. Go do yeah. what you want that too. But don't disrupt the entire company and right. don't, start, don't dip into these huge marketing funds doing right. these crazy antics thinking it's going to somehow right. make it better. And that's like, the change that's happening from old guard to new guard. Right. And the difference of minds of these people. Right. And the way the marketing was going. Right. But I always thought that was super hilarious that he's doing all these crazy antics to get viewership. To, to yeah. get viewership. And yeah. it was just one quick pop. It would be in the news. They would talk about Joe Boxer doing all these crazy things. Yeah. But it wasn't something that was actually gravitating people to pick up an extra pair of underwear. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, you know I mean? yeah. I, well, yeah. I, I think it'd be. It's interesting how you can generate awareness, right? Like you can sell stuff that you way. You can do crazy but things. But it's not focused on product, it's focused on sales. And I think yes. that's like marketing inherently is also still focused on sales. Like yep. it's generate, it's trying to get attention. So it works. And that's why like, but it has to be within character, right? Mm -hmm. but like Red Bull, when they drop someone from the sky, it's so in character with their brand yeah. that you don't see it as a marketing ploy. You're like, oh, it makes sense. It's Red Bull. Red Bull. But it's it is marketing. Yep. I mean that money's coming from a marketing department. Yeah. Because they, they drop someone, but it's courageous. I really think extreme it makes sense. So you don't judge it. But when it's Joe Boxers, like how is Boxers and me jumping from a building? How are they connected? They're and not. that's where people the identity for the brand changes. Yeah. But I, that's why identity of a brand. Fun loving guy is just doing crazy things and yeah. Thank you. Like even uh, the antics. Virgin Galactic, like uh, Richard Branson, same yep. thing. He's a very fun, happy CEO. So when he does like these parties, yacht parties, and goes on his private jet and does all these things. Yeah. It's so natural because uh, Virgin itself is like this fun brand. Yep. And uh, so if it's fitting with the identity. But yeah, if he was to like become the serious businessman, which he's not, then I think it would hurt the company. So it has, as long as it's within character. Yeah, that's I find true. But uh, I've, there is, do you know you could send stuff to space? Space where? Like, it's like shoot her yeah, up the face and just let it go. There's capitals. I kid you not. Look this up on YouTube after. But uh, there, there's this comp the company. I can't remember what they're called, but they will actually ship stuff to say space. Yeah. So some company sent garlic bread to the space. Okay. And it actually is in space. Like they record this whole thing. Yeah. So you can you can do it right now. They're just putting a bunch of space garbage. You can, no, they bring it back. Oh, they bring it back. They bring it back. So the, this person sent garlic brand as a branding thing for their company yeah. to space. So this garlic bread goes into space. It's exposed. It's not like closed or it's like yeah. exposed. Yeah. It comes back and then they ate it. So you could do that. Like it's, it's encapsulated? No, it's open. It's like just garlic bread. <laughs> like I don't know how to explain it. So there's a the garlic bread. It's and exposed. Like, and goes to space. How does it go to space? Like, how are they shipping it up there? Uh, like, you have to see it. or something? Uh, yeah, no. I feel like, like it's this like a machine thing. Super yeah. cartoony. No, dude. I thought about sending something up there just for fun. Make what a video. Send? They record it. I don't know. I, we had ideas. I was like, uh, what if we send this? So I, I have a young fellow that I work with and mm. he helped me with some of the ideas because, again, that's where the ideas are fresh. Mm -hmm. He's like, uh, send a starship to space because uh, uh, Tesla's releasing the starship... Uh, uh, it's, I don't know if it's like a torch, but something similar. So like, yeah, it's not an actual starship. But he's like, then you can label the the video as "I sent a starship to space" because it's this starship torch. But you just yep. leave the torch out. Which I was like, I don't want to do that. And he's like, Why? I'm like, it's misleading. I don't want to do that. Yeah, so, you know, I don't want to tell people I'm sending a starship when I'm sending something else, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm like, but what would make sense is if for whatever, like, again, Joe Boxer could do this. Of we course. sent underwear to space and a pair of underwear to space. And that was back on Earth and, and, and now we're it on. And then, and then you put it out, whatever. And then maybe you raise money for uh, testicular cancer, cancer awareness. Yeah. So now it has a good cause, philanthropy behind it. So like, then you can build a brand around that, right? So, yeah. Well, I just thought, I just wanted to do a brand awareness, know. something. Yeah. Send, send, well, they send garlic bread to space. I'm pretty sure that I didn't get to watch the whole thing, but yeah. I think they eat it. <laughs> I'll pass. <laughs> I don't know. One day, one day. It will become a normality. All that, all that exposure, like, I don't even know. You're going through the I mean, ozone layers and 
Oh yeah, the sun and the space and sun. everything is just hitting it, and you're bringing it back as pushing. Yeah, I mean, I can't remember. I really learned it in science what kind of radiation, but yeah, the Van der Waal belt or whatever, and all this stuff. And this company is doing and, well. You know, I have not look at their financials. <laughs> I think they're a private company. That's funny, but yeah, cool. Should we wrap this thing up? We should. We should. What is the outro? Karn, thank you so much. Thanks for being on the show. <laughs> I appreciate it. Third, <laughs> se- second, uh, second podcast yeah. today. Thanks for recording a second time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, uh, and now we'll see you at the next one. Yeah. No, I appreciate, no, I seriously, genuinely appreciate having you on. It's actually a lot of fun. Yeah. I feel like we could sit here for hours and keep talking. Yeah. Um, Combined with what we did this morning and today, it was like at least like four hours worth of content. Man, I know. And in between what was shutting off and opening up again. Yeah. It we, kind of just makes me laugh. But this is the right time, I think. We had no disturbances. Four o'clock, five o'clock. Audio, I hope, is good. <laughs> we won't know. Audio would be good. Back. Audio would be good. The sun is coming down. I think this backdrop is nice too. Just there's enough sun coming out. I think it's perfect. That you're they get to see the sunset. It It'll be a good experience for the guys. So yeah, thanks for coming on. Let's uh, let's do one again soon. Do you want to say any clo- Do you want to do the closing remarks? We'll just make closing that thing? remarks. Something Dude, we can find a name for this podcast. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't, know. I don't know who's coming on. You or me? <laughs> I think we actually have to bring somebody on. Yeah. Like, hey, thanks for coming on. <laughs> This I should be like, hey, thanks for coming to our office to record this podcast for us. Yeah, honestly, it just feels like we're shooting this shit. Like that, maybe yeah. that should be the podcast, shoot the shit podcast. We bring people on that are doing cool things. We just shoot the show with them. Yeah, yeah. But uh, that's what we're doing. We're shooting the shit. That's pretty much it. Cool. Yeah. Let's go. Cool. <laughs> cool. 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 Appreciate it. Let's go. <laughs>